Brothers and sisters, the theme of last week's khutbah was protecting your family during a fire. And I shared with you ayah number 6 from Surah Al-Tahreem in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nar, wa quduha al-nasu wal hijar, alayha malaikatun, ghilagun, shidadun, la ya'asun Allah ma amarahum wa yaf'aluna ma yu'marun. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to protect ourselves first and foremost. Qu anfusakum. Allah is asking us to protect ourselves first and foremost and our families from a fire. And as human beings, we do everything in our capacity to keep our children out of harm's way. We sacrifice our own luxuries to give them ease. We sacrifice our own sleep so that they can rest in comfort. And we work so hard to provide for them and grant them the opportunities that many of us may or may not have had while we were growing up. So standing and watching our children get hurt is way beyond this natural instinct that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept in every parent's heart. No one in their right mind will allow their children to play with fire in order to learn a lesson. No. We prevent these things from happening. We stop these things before they happen. And this is a basic instinct that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept in us as parents. And this is the human element that is in all of us. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us compliments of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he created this concept of mercy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divided this into 100 portions فَأَمْسَكَ عِنْدَهُ تِسْعَةً وَتِسْعِينَ جُزْءًا This concept of mercy, love and compassion Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reserved 99% of this concept of mercy for himself which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will execute on the Day of Judgment, insha'Allah. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, وَأَنزَلَ فِي الْأَرْضِ جُزْءًا وَاحِدًا Only one part, one one hundredth of this concept of mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shared with all of the universe. All of the love and mercy and compassion that we share with our loved ones and with our fellow human beings. And even with animals, every time your heart goes, Oh, that's so nice, that's so cute. Every kind gesture, every act of kindness that happens in the world. From the beginning till the end. It is all a manifestation of that one part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَمِن ذَلِكَ الْجُزْ يَتَرَاحَمُ الْخَلْقِ The mutual compassion that everyone shows is a part of that is, 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 a, is from the part of that mercy. When a horse, when horses are traveling together, the worry and concern that the, 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 the horse has, lest it trample its own children, when it moves its hoof, to that extent, it all comes from that mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has descended upon us. So we have mercy and compassion wired within us, especially if we are parents, let alone allowing them to get burnt. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the fire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is acknowledging in this ayah, the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to protect ourselves from. It is not the fire of this world. The fire that we keep fire extinguishers for, that we have smoke detectors for. It is not the fire that we have sprinkler systems installed to fight. It is not the fire that you call upon the fire department to control and extinguish. The fire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about is something that is beyond our comprehension. That we cannot even imagine about. 
It is a fire that has been burning since before this whole universe was created. And it only increases in magnitude and in heat. And I usually don't like to talk about scary things during the khutbah. And I don't like to spook people out. But sometimes we as human beings, as Muslims, we need an eye opener. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed the description of the fire of hell in the Quran. And in this particular surah, it is a very harsh description. What keeps this fire burning? It is people. It is hot molten rocks of lava. And the angels designated to look after all of the operations of hell. They are harsh. They are relentless. They are severe. They do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are do as they are told. They are under orders. They are under commands. In that fire, brothers and sisters, there is no cooling off period. There is no parole. There is no way to bribe the warden. There will be no reward for good behavior. It is unlike the punishment of this world. Those angels will not be the angels that we many a times perceive. But they will be under orders and commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frequently in various places in the Qur'an paints this picture for us to understand the severity of what people will face. These are the types of ayat, my brothers and sisters, that should be putting a chill down our spine. They should make us shiver and burst out in tears. But often that does not happen. And the reason behind that is... We don't understand the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sharing with us. Subhanallah, we live in a day and age where books and oceans of knowledge are at our fingertips. Gone are the days when people would have to travel miles and days and weeks and months just to obtain one hadith. Yes, those journeys are still being made for Islamic scholarship to gain depth and ilm. But we have everything at our fingertips. Another reason why these things don't bring a chill on our spine is because we are afraid of things that we see and not necessarily afraid of things that are not in front of us. We are afraid of our health declining because we see what people are going through. We try to exercise and lose weight because we know and we see the consequences of obesity. We work hard and long hours to, to secure financial stability. We work very hard to keep a roof over our, over our heads. We do whatever it takes to keep us protected from the dangers that we see. But what about protecting us from the dangers and from the threats that we don't see. What about understanding the severity and threat of the punishment that starts right from our grave if we don't keep our priorities right? The threat of finding our scale of deeds tilted towards the wrong direction if we have not backed up our, our iman with amal. What about the threat of people coming to us on the day of judgment and taking away and eating away our good deeds because we wronged them, because we took advantage of them, because we hurt their feelings? What about the threat of them bringing their bags and their burden of sin and dumping, on, dumping it on us because we wronged somebody? The Prophet ﷺ has said, مَنْ كَانَتْ عِنْدَهُ مَظْلَمَةٌ لِأَخِيهِ فَلْيَتَحَلَّلْهُ الْيَوْمِ if there is a score that needs to be settled, settle it today. There will be no money that a person can offer on the Day of Judgment. A person's good deeds will be distributed. If a person runs out of good deeds, then a person will have to absorb the sin and evil from other people. And it will be slapped on that person's face. 
So we are afraid of the things that we see, but what about being afraid of the things that we don't see, the fire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us about? And I want to step away from talking about this real fire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about, the fire that we don't see, to move to another fire that we don't see. I'm moving away from talking about one fire that we don't see to another one that we don't see. And that is a fire that our children are walking into every day as they go to school. A fire that our children are being exposed to every time they turn on the TV, every time they surf the web, every time they check their email, every time they go to the mall. A fire that they are exposed to every time they are out with their friends, with their clique, with their peeps. Every time they go out to eat. A fire that is spreading like wildfire. A fire of drinking, drugs, alcohol. This is a fire that we don't see as a fire. What about that fire? And brothers and sisters, as we are sitting here, don't be in this wishful thinking that just because I am a Muslim, just because I say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, that I have some guarantee that my children will not go through this. Don't be under this wishful thinking. Because it is not trickling into our community, into our society, it's already here. There is a fire that is already out there. And if we, all we do is focus on our work and our careers and on our businesses and we neglect our children, we neglect to be a role model for our children, if we fail to be there for our children, if all we focus our attention on is their grades and if the only thing that worries us and makes us upset is their declining GPA, then we are going to have a bigger problem on our hands. My uncles and aunties, brothers and sisters, the times that we grew up in are not the times that our children are growing up in. And by far the times that this world is seeing has never come upon planet earth. Things are different. And things are going to get much worse. In this new world that we live in, there are different challenges, greater challenges. And shaitan is playing all of his cards. Just think about the statements of shaitan that Allah has shared with us in the Quran. When shaitan was ousted from Jannah because he failed to do sajda upon Allah's command. Look at what shaitan said. فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ because of the fact that I erred, I am going to sit right in their straight path. So even when we are focusing and struggling to do good, shaitan will be sitting right there. I'm going to attack them from every direction. I'm going to come at them from the front, from the behind, from the right and the left. And most of those people will not turn out grateful. Most of those people will fail. Shaitan is working double overtime. And he is putting all of his players to work. We live in a time, not necessarily society, because the whole, the whole earth is one place now. We live in a time when it is encouraged, the, when, we, when our children are encouraged to do what they want, when they want, where they want, how they want, and who they want it with. Which is the total opposite of the concept of Islam. What is Islam? Islam means to submit. It means to surrender to the will and the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The total opposite of what the times we are living in are encouraging, not just our children, but ourselves to do. Brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, when will we realize, when will we come terms to this fact? When, when, we, when will we realize that the bright future for our children is not limited to a good education? 
When will we stop living for others? When will we stop pleasing others? When will we stop sacrificing, spending good wholesome time with our children in order to open another business? In order to push extra hours. And if you're struggling to make ends meet, that's a different story. That's also another test. But if a person is doing all of these things just to maintain a status quo, just so that people can stand up and, and meet you and greet you, when will this stop? Let me give you a reality check, myself included. You think people will remember us when we die? Oh, we do all of these things, we sacrifice our children, we put everything in the rearview mirror so that we can be known. You think people care when we die? You think people will remember us? They may show up to a janazah if they're not busy at work, let alone coming to the cemetery. And then after a week, after a week, they'll show up to this innovation called a Quran Khani to recite Quran. When you go to these things, most of the people are chit-chatting and talking and talking about, oh, where's the food coming from today? Really, is that what we want to leave behind? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said, "Ida mat ibn Adam in qata'a amaluhu illa an thalath." When a person dies, there's only three ways that a person receives benefit in the grave: an ongoing charity, any token of knowledge that is left behind that people are benefiting from, and waladin salihin yadghulahu, a righteous child that prays for you. No one else. It may last for a little while, but who really matters? Your children, your family. And as I stand here, brothers and sisters, no one in their right mind, including myself, is saying that being successful is wrong. Getting a good education is wrong. Pushing our kids to do good in school is a bad thing. No one is saying that. But these are not the only things that matter. And these things will definitely not matter in the hereafter. Especially if that success, if that push to getting good grades doesn't allow them to be a good Muslim, let alone a good human being. What is the meaning of education nowadays? Let's be real. Education doesn't make you a good person. Okay? Being a good person makes you a good person. There are many people, no offense, very, very educated. But when they open their mouth, ignorance spills out. Arrogance spills out. What use was that education? Your humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your adherence to the sunnah, makes a person a good person. Not just knowing a lot. Even in Islamic terms. Just because a person studied Islam doesn't mean that they're a good person. There are many a people, many a du'at, who are very arrogant. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and guide them and everyone. But if we lose our deen in the process of pushing our children to get a good education, what did we gain? Inna Allah la yanduru ila suwarikum wa atsamikum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look at your faces, your appearances. وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَعَمَالِكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at what's on the inside, what's in the heart, and how your actions follow suit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at an education. Allah will not ask for a degree. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not ask you how many businesses you had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not ask you for a spreadsheet on the day of judgment. We go to school so we can land a job, so we can provide for our families. We tell our children these same things. But what about our real provisions? We need to get real and think about these things. Invest in Islamic books. Invest in Islamic games. Invest in Islamic programs. Yes, they are not cheap, but neither is the $50 video game. Or even more, I think. I think it was 50 bucks in my day. Spend time with our children, to be with them, to groom them. Don't tell them to pray, don't tell them to read Qur'an. Read Qur'an with them. 
Establish a daily regimen or something on a weekly basis that revolves around understanding Allah, understanding Quran, understanding the Sunnah, learning the lives of the Sahaba. And subhanAllah, there are so many books out there that are so reader friendly that were not available in my time and definitely not available in your time. This is an investment. Reward them. Make it around pizza. Have, some, have one of these gatherings and take them to Tutti Frutti. I'm not being paid for that, by the way. I'm just saying. Reward them. Don't tell them to pray. Pray with them. Bring them to the, bring them to the masjid. The masjid, and digest this. The concept of the masjid is not the same. You don't pray and go. A masjid is not the house of Allah. It is the home of Allah. Where you pray and you stay. The function of our masajid have changed with the times that we are living in. Bring your children to the masjid. Explain to them what a masjid is. Let them come to the masjid. And you know what? Things are changing. Things are changing. Don't think that you're going to come to the masjid and an uncle is going to be like, Hey, what are you doing? Be quiet. Sit down. Things are changing. Things are changing. Don't feel intimidated. Don't feel afraid. Bring them to the masjid. They will learn one day, inshallah. And for those of us who attend, be patient, be tolerant. Would we rather these youth get together at some hookah bar? Or at some coffee shop? Or studying with, studying with uh, 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 a guy studying with girls? At, you know, uh, a study group? Would we rather this? We need to be an example for our children. We need to show them. We need to be better than those people who show up in the last minute for Jummah. This is an example we are, this is one thing, one bad example that we, that we are sharing with our children. That the only one prayer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mandates that you stop, drop, and go. Fas'aw ila dhikrillah. For that, people are trickling in five minutes after the prayer has started. This is an example that we show to our children. We need to move forward. We need to, we need to be different as a community now. Park your cars properly. Brothers, cell phones, turn them off. Really? Really? We are still in this stage of our community? Fathers and mothers, tell me. When you have to say something again and again and again and again, who do we say that to in our household? Kids. Are we kids? I don't think so. So let us be there for our children. Let us care about their deen. And be that change that we want to see in our children. I want to share with you one story before I wrap up for this week. Let's see who can I pick on over here. Hatem, how much you make an hour? Don't answer that. Okay? I know he won't be offended. But that's not a question you ask, right? You don't ask a woman her age and a man his wage. Remember this, okay? A son goes to a father and says, Dad, how much do you make an hour? <laughs> what kind of a question is that? None of your business how much I make an hour. Why are you asking me this? What do you need? So the son says, I need 50 bucks. Get away from here. What do you need 50 bucks for? I've given you so much. You have everything you need. Why do you need 50 bucks for? Why are you just going to ask me for 50 bucks? So the son goes away in his room. And the dad is sitting down for a little while. And he's thinking to himself. Man, you know what? I was really hard on the kid. So he goes to his room. And he asks his son. He said, listen. I was a little harsh with you. You need 50 bucks? Here you go. Okay, so his son asks him again, how much do you make an hour? Now at this time, you know, the father was kind of soft. He's like, son, I make $100 an hour. Okay. Okay, thank you, dad. Conversation ended. The father goes back downstairs and the son comes back with that $50 note and a whole bunch of dollar bills that are crumpled up from his piggy bank. 
And he goes up to his dad and he gives him that hundred dollars. Now the dad's like, what's up with you? What's wrong? You just asked me for fifty dollars, right? You heard a whole lecture from me. I gave you the fifty bucks. Now you're coming and giving me a hundred dollars? He said, dad, you make a hundred dollars an hour, right? Take this hundred dollars and come home early tomorrow. Come home early tomorrow. And this goes for mothers too. So please, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, soon to be's, please take this issue seriously. Please take this issue seriously. You know, there's a saying in English that some people are so poor, all they have is money. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم